It is Illinois in Focus Daily. I'm Greg Bishop doing a pre recorded program for you uh, as we are traveling to the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. We'll be there on the ground all week long, bringing you updates from the protests to what's happening inside the convention hall as Democrats make it official that Kamala Harris is their presidential candidate. So a lot to tackle there all this week. Uh, So definitely be sure to like, subscribe, hit that notification bell and join us as we give you the latest of what's going on. Uh, And then a little bit later on on this uh, pre-recorded edition of Illinois in Focus Daily, we'll hear from Illinois Attorney General Kwame Raoul, chatted with him at the state fair about gun ban litigation and not just in Illinois, but he's in other states as well, defending those gun laws. So uh, a lot of that coming up here with Illinois in focus daily, but the Illinois state fair coming to a close Sunday being the last day. And, uh, it was, it was good. I wasn't out there nearly as much as I uh, typically am, but, uh, got to take that sky glide each and every year. Uh, it's something that the wife and I do, and we've done it together since high school. Uh, But the fairgrounds uh, hustling and bustling over the weekend, Uh, just a beautiful fairgrounds, a lot of tax dollars going into it to update roofs, update infrastructure, uh, get sidewalks nice and clean. Uh, But just an overall positive experience. And I know a lot of families, uh, especially from the area, this is one of their things they do just as they're getting ready to get their kids back into school. Uh, Surely it brings an economic impact as people from all across the states uh, focus on agriculture. But it's, of course, not just about the agriculture where they do uh, livestock shows and competitions. It's about the rides. It's about the food. It's about taking in uh, all of the different things that uh, that go on there. Uh, but I got to say, uh, it was pretty remarkable. Uh, went to a concert, uh, saw the Smashing Pumpkins, and uh, just being there at the fairgrounds during a concert at night, uh, there's something uh, kind of surreal about it with the lights of the rides and everything else that's going on. Uh, but uh, I'm not going to, of course, air any of what they, they played because uh, I would get hit with a copyright strike, and we don't want that here for America's Talking Network. Uh, but it was it was interesting to kind of hear some of the banter in between some of the songs. And uh, Billy Corgan, the front man for uh, Smashing Pumpkins, of course, if you're not familiar with Smashing Pumpkins, a yeah, whole host of you know blockbuster songs. Uh, you know, Tonight, Tonight, Today. Uh, and uh, and uh, he's still putting out albums, but he definitely played a ton of hits uh, like Zero and Bullet with the Butterfly Wings. Uh, All of that uh, getting a lot of uh, uh, a lot of applause from the crowd there at the state fair. But the banter in between uh, Billy Corgan talking to James Iha, his longtime guitarist, original guitarist for the for the Smashing Pumpkins going back to 1992, I think it is, if not earlier. Uh, But uh, also uh, Jimmy Chamberlain on the drums, an original member. They had some other members there that uh, weren't original, but still uh, pretty remarkable. And quite frankly, the band is from Chicago. Billy Corgan, I believe, still lives in Chicago and he was actually visiting Springfield. Uh, and then took in the Abraham Lincoln uh, Presidential Library Museum uh, and a host of other things. But the banter back and forth was interesting because, you know, they play a, a smash hit song. And then Billy would ask James, hey, did you go see the butter cow? And they said, oh, there's a butter cow. And, you know, just the, the banter back and forth. They even said they were going to have a post party at the butter cow. We did not go to that. <laughs> Highly doubt that actually happened. But here's some more of that banter back and forth. For some of you out there who may be Smashing Pumpkins fans, caution, I did have to add some bleeps in this because we're, you know, family friendly. What the fans really want to know is, did we beat Little Wayne's record? <laughs> oh. Do we have a record here? I don't think so. Oh. Okay. Close! We came close to Little Wayne's record. Okay. We saw Little Wayne. Little Wayne, by the way, That's it being reported that he did get James the uh, record uh, attendance for Illinois State Fairs. So James Iha asked to do a rap.
the top and goofy. Thank you so much. We are the Smashing Pumpkin. And what was really cool was being in the background, you had some heat lightning going on, uh, having its own light show. So that itself was was pretty neat. But after they ended, uh, there were fireworks presented. That happens after every grandstand show. Billy Corgan staying out on the stage. They didn't do an encore, uh, but Billy Corgan staying out on stage and actually uh, taking some of the front rows stuff and signing it for people. So that was uh, that was pretty neat. But the state fair is over. And that means it's now time for the Democratic National Convention, something we will talk about in moments. It is Illinois in Focus Daily, a special pre-recorded edition as we're traveling and heading to Chicago to cover the DNC. So stay tuned. Much more coming up here with Illinois in Focus Daily. I'm Greg Bishop. Like, subscribe, hit that notification bell, and join us each and every weekday morning at America's Talking Network. From Pulaski County to Lake County, Democrats deliver for working families. Illinois Democrats raised the minimum wage to a living wage. All they're being reminded after, after the DNC is every single time when they go to the grocery store, when they go to their local um, supply store to pick up supplies or fill their gas tank, they're going to be reminded about what the Democrat agenda looks like and how it affects them. That's uh, just uh, some of the back and forth you're expected to hear uh, this week as the Democratic National Convention kicks off in Chicago. The Illinois State Fair's over. Now Illinois Democrats going to Chicago, being joined by Democrats from across the country uh, for their national convention. Four days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, we, of course, will be on the ground there. We've got a team with the Center Square and Blue Room Stream, so we'll have video and interviews and a whole host of things. Uh, looking forward to, to bringing that to you here. But uh, obviously, uh, looking at what the messaging is going to be, uh, obviously looking at what the uh, protest situation is going to be. Uh, and apparently there is going to be a, a contingent of protests Monday. And that's supposed to be the largest as it's being reported. Tens of thousands of people possible and uh, all of that uh, opposing uh, the war in Gaza uh, and the uh, perceived aggression from Israel against Hamas after the October 7th attack uh, Hamas had against Israel. Uh, so you can see tens, tens of thousands of protesters Monday uh, and the safety and security situation, obviously something else we're going to be reporting on. Uh, but there's a lot of activity going on inside the convention hall where you'll hear uh, a lot of what Democrats are saying. And we got a bit of a preview of this from Governor, uh, Governor J.B. Pritzker last week whenever he addressed the Democratic County Chairs Association, uh, talking about how Democrats deliver. And right here in Illinois, we get to show off our own blue wall. Our state party is stronger than ever before, and our County Chairs Association is knocking the cover off the ball. From Pulaski County to Lake County, Democrats deliver for working families. Illinois Democrats raised the minimum wage to a living wage. We lowered costs for working families by eliminating grocery taxes, canceling medical debt, lowering small business taxes, and lowering the cost of prescription drugs. Democrats rebuilt 7,000 miles of roads and 600 bridges, our river ports, our airports, and so much more. We enshrined workers' rights into our Constitution. We expanded health care coverage to hundreds of thousands more people across our state. Democrats invested $3 billion more into public education. And of course, uh, all of that with the largest state budgets consecutively year after year after year under Governor uh, J.B. Pritzker. Uh, and he talked about investing in roads. The state has the second highest uh, gas tax in the country uh, and a whole host of other uh, 
uh, high ranking uh, figures that taxpayers are paying, including seventy five million dollars for the DNC, similar to how the RNC cost taxpayers seventy five million dollars. Uh, and that's with all kinds of law enforcement agencies coming in and all the barricades they got to set up and a whole host of other uh, security apparatus. Uh, but, you know, that was the governor last week at the uh, Democrat uh, County Chairs Association here in Springfield uh, before going out to the state fair where he talked more about, uh, well, a bit of a preview of what we're going to hear, at least from the governor when he addresses the DNC uh, this week. I'm also proud that we're going to win up and down the ticket in November, right? It feels electric, Democrats, doesn't it? All right, I'm so excited about what's happening at the federal level. And of course, next week, we're going to show America what Illinois Democrats are all about. Because as Juliana said, Democrats deliver. But it's because we have done so much here in the state of Illinois. Now, you've heard a few of those things. Let me start by saying that we have enshrined into our Constitution workers' rights. We're a union state. We'll always be a union state. We stand up for people's freedom. So you know what we did? We outlawed book bans in Illinois. And we enshrined into law a woman's right to choose. And we've made it safe, a safe haven for women all across this country when they're trying to preserve their own rights and exercise those rights they have to escape states like Iowa and Kentucky and Missouri. And where do they come? The great state of Illinois. But it's not the only policies uh, that are uh, attracting people uh, to Illinois. Uh, you've got the non-citizen migrant health care that's costing taxpayers a billion plus dollars and even more in this current fiscal year. Now, I was able to obtain numbers uh, with the center square from the state's agencies looking at these things. And as of July 9th, nearly 53,000 non-citizens are enrolled in the Health Benefits for Immigrant Adults and Seniors program. Of that, the race of more than 19,000 isn't known. The ethnicity of more than 10,000 isn't known. And as of June 24th, the total cost of the program to the taxpayer here in the state of Illinois since July of 2023 is $711 million. State Senator Terry Bryant, a Republican, joined other Republicans to react to the DNC heading up this week. They held a virtual news conference on Friday, and she reacted to some of those numbers and the prospect of even more coming, and whether or not uh, Kamala Harris would increase the amount of taxpayer dollars for things like subsidizing non citizen migrant health care. Uh, if Harris were elected, then of course, uh, we have to take them at their word. Uh, no matter what she's saying now, we know what the history has been of where the money is going in this country. Right now, the emphasis is on non-citizens. And of course, in Illinois, I would always point everyone back to what we've seen at the welcome centers. So at welcome centers, I would use a uh, uh, where I've actually been at the Welcome Center in Carbondale, where you go into a facility that's supposed to be for all immigrants, and yet the application that you fill out or the form is only written in Spanish in a town that has a university where there are immigrants from India, Pakistan, Iraq, Iran, um, from uh, Taiwan, uh, from Somalia. And if you want to get an application for help there, you cannot get that application because it's only written in Spanish and you can't even get one there in English. And believe me, I've been in there to try. So it is very disturbing to see that, um, that there are, uh, that there's so much money going out uh, and it's questionable where that money is going. So again, uh, Senator Terry Bryant uh, questioning how much money is going out and exactly where it's going, especially if you don't know the race and ethnicity of individuals who are getting these taxpayer subsidized health care benefits. Uh, so Democrats uh, deliver is a message we expect. Republicans countering that, at least in the state of Illinois, saying, hey, the state of Illinois has high property taxes, high overall taxes. You know, our debt's out of control uh, while we have the largest spending plans in state history. Sue Resin, a Republican from Morris, uh, really laid out uh, some of the things that uh, Republicans say is not good policy. Democrats chose to burn businesses with another job killing tax increase. As family budgets are stretched to their breaking point, forcing families to make really tough decisions, Illinois Democrats used their tax hikes to deliver the most expensive budget in state history. 
While the Biden-Harris policies were triggering a crisis at the border, Governor Pritzker and Illinois Democrats invited it here by creating a welfare state for non-citizens at the expense of Illinois residents. Illinois Democrats are spending $1 billion per year on programs to support non-citizens, diverting precious resources away from struggling Illinois families who need them most. Illinois Democrats have prioritized criminals over families by implementing catch and release policies as crime rates continue to rise. Meanwhile, thousands of Illinois students beg for their educational opportunities to be preserved, but Illinois Democrats turned their backs and delivered only disappointment. And she's talking there about the Illinois Invest in Kids School Choice Scholarship Program that provided tax credits to individuals donating private dollars to scholarships for families of lower means to go to a private school of their choice. Uh, that program ended at the end of last year, despite children and families showing up to the state capitol saying, hey, we're benefiting from this immensely. Please restore this. But they didn't. Legislators did not restore it. Uh, instead, uh, they, they must have listened to the teachers unions who were adamantly opposed to this. Uh, so uh, Senator Don DeWitt uh, doubling down on the end of the Illinois Invest in Kids program, something that uh, Democrats delivered, he said. All because Illinois Democrats refused to extend the program. And I want to repeat, Democrats refused to extend this program. These scholarships provided generational opportunities to help families with income challenges improve their children's opportunities for educational success. They provided choices for parents. Republicans supported an extension, but Democrats said no. Next week in Chicago, Governor J.B. Pritzker under the bright lights will talk at the DNC about how, quote, Democrats deliver unquote. They deliver all right. They deliver abysmal education proficiency statistics and deliver disappointment to families that just want their kids to have a quality education. Invest in Kids has been monumentally successful. And uh, DeWitt goes on to talk about how it's helped tens of thousands of families uh, get their kids into a school of their choice, but not any longer, at least when it comes to getting that uh, scholarship from the Invest in Kids School Choice Scholarship Tax Credit Program. Uh, but back to Sue Rezin, uh, I had asked Friday when they held this virtual news conference with uh, Senate Republicans about uh, how are Republicans going to grab attention all of this week because the media is just going to be all over the DNC and they're going to have, you know, live coverage and interviews. And I mean, we're going to be on the ground at the DNC focusing on what the Democrats have to say. But Sue Rezin says to combat that uh, Republicans surely are going to be out there messaging. But she said it's going to be as simple as people going to the store and seeing how the economy is impacting them. It will receive tremendous coverage. You will see a bump. You'll see marching bands. You'll um, hear John Legend or uh, Legend at his concert. I mean, they're pulling out the stops for the convention. But what really matters is after the convention, when the constituents, the taxpayers of the state of this country, really get back into their routine of uh, daily going to the grocery store and being reminded that they can't afford to feed a family of four or trying to figure out how am I going to fill my gas tank this week so I can go to work. We have families that are trying to buy school supplies uh, because it's the beginning of the school year and realizing that it's very costly. All they're being reminded after, after the DNC is every single time when they go to the grocery store, when they go to their local um, supply store to pick up supplies or fill their gas tank, they're going to be reminded about what the Democrat agenda looks like and how it affects them. That so interesting to hear how, yeah, while the media is going to be uh, all over the DNC, it's going to be splashed in the newspapers and everything. Resin saying that uh, voters just need to go back to the store uh, to, I guess, splash back into reality. Uh, but Governor J.B. Pritzker already out there talking about Malort as the unofficial shot of uh, the Democrats National Convention in Chicago. 
Uh, but again, last week he, he said he just wants to be a good host. I just want to be a good um, you know, host. I want to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to show off what a great state we are and make sure that we get launched into the fall in the right way so we elect Democrats up and down the ticket. And uh, we'll be there on the ground to hear that messaging uh, all next, all this week uh, at the Democratic National Convention with the Center Square, Illinois in Focus Daily, America's Talking Network. I'm Greg Bishop. Follow me anywhere to get the latest live updates. Just follow Bishop on Air on X, Facebook, Instagram. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell here with America's Talking Network for live broadcasts each and every weekday morning. All right. Make it happen. We have to deal with the construct that the Supreme Court gives us. And so the arguments we make, the pleadings that we file, uh, make arguments within that, within that construct. That is Illinois Attorney General Kwame Raoul responding to a question I had asked him at the Illinois State Fair last week about the impact the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin case has on how states are to defend gun bans or any kind of gun control law. Welcome back, Illinois in Focus Daily. I'm Greg Bishop in the pre-recorded edition as we travel to the Democratic National Convention up in Chicago. But we will be live Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday morning, giving you all you need to know about what's going on on the ground in Chicago and a review of some of the uh, the conversations that are being had and so on. Uh, but definitely want to get this out for you as we're uh, less than a month away from the Southern District of Illinois Federal Court and Judge Stephen McGlynn having a bench trial on the state's gun and magazine ban. In the saga that that's been since it was enacted in January of 2023, lawsuits filed in federal courts in both the Southern District and the Northern District, different outcomes on preliminary issues, those initial you know requests of injunctions while they work out the meat and potatoes of the case and all the arguments that there are those preliminary injunctions having different outcomes in the northern district and the southern district the southern district actually granted a preliminary injunction that lasted six days where the law was blocked and people went and bought semi-automatic firearms but then the appeals courts reversed that uh, particular uh, injunction and then the uh, appeals court sided with the state only on those preliminary grounds. And even these cases went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. But the U.S. Supreme Court said it's not ready yet. We need final action. So back to the Southern District, we could get final action sometime after September 16th when Judge Stephen McGlynn holds that bench trial uh, to hear from all the experts and uh, so on. Uh, but I, talking with uh, Illinois Attorney General Kwame Raoul last week at the Illinois State Fair during Democrat Day, I asked him about, you know, this uh, how the state goes about defending these types of gun control laws. We're in a country where you know there is a Second Amendment and there is a um, rights that are born out of the Second Amendment. Uh, but with with every uh, uh, constitutional amendment, with that, all the laws in our country, there's always a balancing act that we do, and certainly uh, public safety is important in, in in that balance. We've seen a number of mass shootings we see uh, daily in urban and even in rural communities uh, uptick in gun violence we see trafficking of guns into the hands of people who are ineligible to uh, possess them either because of felony conviction or because of uh, um, other disqualifying factors and there are people who engage in an industry to uh, legally purchase the gun then transfer them illegally into the hands who are ineligible to purchase them. And so that's something that uh, we have um, passed laws, we've invested in a crime gun tracing platform so we can have crime gun intelligence to, to see the patterns, uh, to detect the individuals who are involved in straw purchasing and, and transferring guns into the hands of people, again, who uh, are ineligible by law to to, to possess them. It's an important mission for us. We partnered heavily with the ATF on um, gun trafficking cases and, and we've been successful uh, 
uh, in those those efforts. A lot there with the attorney general uh, talking about uh, the efforts that are underway and all of the different types of uh, bad actors that he's trying to go after, those who are trafficking firearms or buying them for people who shouldn't have them and so on. Uh, but really, the bottom line, what about the Bruin decision, uh, that New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin decision that came out, what was that, 2022? where uh, you had the uh, U.S. Supreme Court lay out that uh, you can no longer have this balancing of interests, you know, balancing somebody's Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms versus public safety. Uh, like, that's that's no longer the go-to. The go-to is text, history, and tradition, being that any kind of gun law has to conform with the text of the Second Amendment, may well regulate a militia being necessary for the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, the history of that, and also any tradition of that. Uh, so that's the kind of context. Well, I asked uh, the, uh, the Attorney General, uh, you know, after that decision, how has that changed how a state like Illinois goes about? to defending gun control laws like bans of commonly owned firearms like an AR-15. You know, obviously, the decisions that come down uh, from the Supreme Court uh, create a common law structure that we, we must follow in our arguments and in our policy making. And whenever we pass a law that has to deal with, uh, that touches upon the Second Amendment, we have to deal with the construct that the Supreme Court gives us. And so the arguments we make, the pleadings that we file, uh, make arguments within that within that construct. So he uh, he recognizes there is a new construct, but uh, they say that they're making arguments within that construct. One of the arguments that uh, apparently are being made is uh, these are uh, AR-15s are military style weapons, military style weapons. Uh, obviously, we'll hear what the arguments are from the plaintiffs when we get to the Southern District of Illinois Federal Court and the experts testify in front of Judge Stephen McGlynn uh, for a bench trial on the final merits. Uh, but we'll uh, we'll obviously watch that closely. Uh, but uh, Raul's not just defending laws in Illinois against challenges. Uh, he's also defending laws uh, in other states by filing friends of the court briefs. He's got cases where he's uh, you know, filed with other attorneys general in Massachusetts and uh, you know, other places like not just gun bans, but also uh, prohibitions of certain people being able to carry certain types of firearms like people under the age of 21. Can they have a concealed carry permit and so on? Uh, but I asked him about, you know, what's what's behind that and why go out there and defend other states' gun bans and gun control laws. Yeah, so so the effort to keep communities safe is not just an Illinois issue, it's a national issue. Uh, the problems that we may face um, in Illinois, whether it's a Highland Park or Washington Park or whether it's daily gun violence, are, are also faced in other states that try to move similar policy. And so uh, I spend a lot of time with my colleagues, my uh, uh, attorney general colleagues from other states, both Republican and Democrat, and we try to work collectively on issues, and I support them and uh, on cer certain advocacy as they support me on, on advocacy, and I think that's important. So going out to other states and filing friends of the court or amicus briefs in those courts uh, to defend uh, different types of gun control laws. Uh, clearly, that uh, keeps the attorney general's office pretty busy, but he's also busy in the state of Illinois. Uh, he has been uh, defending not just the gun ban in the Southern District, which we've talked about. Uh, that's going to a bench trial September 16th. He's also in the Southern District with a case challenging the firearm owner identification card. And this is uh, Myers v. Kelly. We've talked about this case in particular. Uh, and some of the latest there is there's a motion to stay by the Illinois State Police Director, Brendan Kelly. Uh, and this is a case challenging the FOID card, uh, blocking people with past criminal convictions like having drugs, for instance. Uh, and uh, part of the motion to stay in the Myers v. Kelly case challenging the FOID card uh, most recently, just a little over a week ago, uh, they filed this document that shows uh, the plaintiff was actually arrested with uh, cocaine back in 1990 uh, or 92. Uh, but they've got this document here essentially showing uh, you know, a charge of uh, possession uh, and uh, some, some other uh, you know, charges here. Uh, the defendant uh, committed to a, you know, a county jail term for three years. 
a uh, fine of $1,000. Uh, you can see even more of these documents. So uh, clearly, uh, you've got uh, this case coming down to should people who have prior criminal record records uh, be pre prevented from having a right to keep and bear arms, even if that was, what, 40 years ago almost? Uh, if not uh, a little shy of, uh, gosh, well, I'm thinking I'm an 83, uh, 30 plus years ago. All right. Uh, so we'll watch all of this, where this goes, how that's going to be handled by the uh, court with the Foyd card case. But we clearly will also be following very closely what happens in the Southern District of Illinois federal court with the challenge of Illinois gun and magazine ban. All right. That's all I've got for you here with Illinois in Focus Daily, a special pre-recorded edition uh, while we travel to the DNC up in Chicago. So be sure to like, subscribe hit that notification bell and get updates from the center square at thecentersquare.com where you can obviously uh, get the newsletter and uh, be sure to follow us on YouTube at America's Talking Network each and every weekday morning here with Illinois in Focus Daily.